Hello sailors, this is the Dodger Kebab. Although people think the Mega Drive is Sega's attempt to bring the arcade experience home with its many coin-op conversions, some of which were fantastic, although some were utter pony. In this video, I want to explore the idea that actually during the mid to late 80s, the Sega Master System was already doing the job of bringing the arcade into your living room. Although both America and Japan treated the Master System like some sort of ginger stepchild and basically ignored the console in favour of Nintendo's NES, in Europe and especially here in England, we welcomed the Master System like it was a new Greg store that outsold the NES 4 to 1. Why was it so different over here? Well, in Europe, two things were huge in video games. First off, arcade games, which were the pinnacle of gaming, and of these, Sega were making the most graphically advanced ones. The other big thing was home micro computers like the ZX Spectrum. And the ZX Spectrum was the dog's bollocks. You could buy games for like two or three pound a go, and sure the games were leagues below the quality you saw in the arcade, but it's all we had. And then Sega and Nintendo turned up to the party, both with instant loading futuristic cartridge based game consoles. But Nintendo prices were taking the piss. We were all used to paying three pound a game, and they wanted 40 quid a pop. So everyone in England told them to do one. Sega on the other hand, were charging as little as £15 for their budget games, and even the top boy full price titles were at least a tenner cheaper than what Nintendo were asking. Plus, on top of this, it was made by Sega. Sega made OutRun. Now they're making a console. Sign me the fuck up. So that's where we are. It's the 80s. But can the Master System really bring the arcade into your home? In 1985, Hang On arrived in arcades and blew players away with its super smooth 3D sprite scaling racing action. And the cabinet itself was a bike that you had to climb aboard and ride to control the gameplay. The home version was also released in 1985. It came out to the Japanese version of the Sega Mark system, the Sega Mark III. But the home version did have to make some cutbacks. Unless you're blind, the graphical difference is obvious, but there are small things that have a large impact on the game. The the road width feels a hell of a lot slimmer than the arcade version, so avoiding other bikes is harder. Then on top of that, instead of just being bounced away, you touch another bike, you just flat out explode. That said, I like the countdown in the corner that tells you how much of the course section there is left, and it does follow the arcade level design correctly, so you get the same backgrounds in the same order. All in all, it's a pretty decent port of a game the Sega Master System was never going to be able to do justice to. Some people will be shocked to learn that Teddy Boy was actually a Sega arcade game, considering just how common this game was on the Mars system, but actually the backstory to this one gets even crazier. In the arcade, this game's original full name is Teddy Boy Blues, and Sega made it in partnership with Japanese singer Yoko Ishino, who released a song called Teddy Boy Blues at the same time Sega released the game. <laughs> A rendition of her song not only features as the game's main background music, but also she features in the game's opening, performing her song once again. Plus, she also appears later on in the games during the bonus stages. Teddy Boy was actually a popular arcade game in Japan, and even made it to number two in Japanese arcade publication Game Machine of the highest cocktail cabinet games during June 1985. Coincidentally, on the opposite page in the same issue is an advert for Teddy Boy Blues with Yoko telling players her debut song has been made into an exciting video game. Now, the Sega Mark III version was released the same year as the arcade game. It's actually pretty faithful. I'm not going to sit here and tell you this is the best game ever, because it's not. I mean, come on, it's Teddy Boy. But if you like the arcade game, then the Sega Mark System version does a damn good job of playing the same game. The only real shame here is that all reference to Yoko Ishino are gone, well, except her music is still playing in the background. She's not in the intro because there isn't one, and she's not in the game's bonus stages because now it's totally different. If you have the western version of this game, its name is changed from Teddy Boy Blues to just Teddy Boy, and all the music is totally different, thus removing the last part of Yoko Ishino from this game altogether. <laughs> 
Action Fighter was a Sega arcade game in 1986, and I hate it. The controls are too jittery, and you crash into stuff. The time limit is bullshit, so you end up needing to go really fast to make it on time. But when you do, you don't have enough time to react to the obstacles, and you crash again. You can change from a bike to an airplane. It gets a bit better, but not much. The whole experience is just wank, and it's the gaming equivalent of soiled underwear. Avoid. So what does this mean for the Master System version that was released in Japan the same year? Well, actually, it's a lot better. It's not a good game, it's just not dog shit anymore. The controls feel a lot more stable now, and you get far more advanced warnings about upcoming obstacles, and you can actually control the game while going at high speeds. You still have the different sections where you take control of different types of vehicles, and they all play fine too. Like I say, this is not a good game, but it does fix all the bullshit the arcade game foes at ya. Remember in Space Harrier when it said, Welcome to the Fantasy Zone. Get ready. Well, in the following year, Sega blessed the world of 1986 with an arcade game which would let players revisit the Fantasy Zone, simply called Fantasy Zone. But instead of playing as some guy who could fly because he was holding a laser cannon, you now play the spaceship called Whoppa Whoppa. And actually, Space Harrier and Fantasy Zone did actually merge together in the unreleased PC Engine prototype game Space Fantasy Zone. But enough with the history lesson, because I'm supposed to be talking about Fantasy Zone. You probably already know, so briefly, it's a side-scrolling shooting game, which is bloody good fun. Blow up all the bases on the level to make the boss appear, and every so often you get to spend the coins you earn on ship upgrades. Like all the other games on this list so far, the Sega Sweatshop must have been working overtime, because they got a Master System port out the same year as the arcade release. These days, a quick turnover normally means a shit rush job, but Fantasy Zone on the Mars system is really good. Sure, the colour palette is smaller and the animation for the sprites and backgrounds have been simplified, but it plays just as well as the arcade game. It's a really good port. Bizarrely, Sega let Sunsoft port Fantasy Zone to the Nintendo Famicom. Sunsoft did such a good job. A few years later, Sega commissioned Sunsoft to make a Mega Drive Fantasy Zone game, which was also fantastic. And it looks like I can't help talking about the history of this game. Station Scandal is a game that could have been brilliant, but thanks to its shitty hitbox programming, it's not fun at all. The problem here is that instead of bad guys having a hitbox area, which counts as a hit if you punch it, the game uses the actual sprite as the hitbox area. So you have to be pixel perfect accurate when attacking an enemy. Now add in one hit deaths and this game can fuck off. It's such a shame, as I like the graphics and the style of this game, but it's impossible to get anywhere with it. So, did they fix it for the Master System conversion, which was released in the West as My Hero? No! It's still utter bollocks. The graphics are really close to the arcade game, but so is the hit detection, so this game can do one. This is Space Harrier, the last game on this list from 1986. Don't need to talk about the arcade game. You know what this is. Everyone knows what this is. Shooty, shooty, bang, bang. It's running on even more advanced sprite scaling hardware than what Hang On from earlier was on. So is this even worth bringing to the Master System? Turns out that yes, it is actually. It's incredible that the Master System conversion runs as well as it does, considering that one, the limits of the Master System hardware make something like this very hard to pull off. Off. And two, Sega managed to get this conversion release the same year that the arcade game came out. If you ask me, this port turned out really well, although it's not surprising since it was programmed by genius programmer of the Mega Drive Sonic games and whoops, I just broke the law again, Yuji Naka. What makes the Master System port even more impressive is when you put it up against the Mega Drive version, which is utter pants. Sega really botched the Mega Drive version and somehow it plays far worse than the PC Engine version. And when you compare it to other Mega Drive games like Panorama Cotton, it's really easy to see how dreadful this is. I'd say that the Master System version makes even better use of the hardware than its 16-bit brother. Probably the programmer had some sort of inside information on how it worked.
1987 was an incredible year for movies, for music, and Sega topped it off by releasing Afterburner into the arcade with a cabinet that span you around to give you a thrill ride as you played. But here lies the problem with any home port of this game. Even if you did own the most powerful home hardware at the time, which was the Sharp 68000 Japanese home computer with the flight stick and a Roland sound card, you can reproduce the graphics and gameplay, but you can't reproduce the hydraulic cabinet experience. With that said, Afterburner is still a fantastic game without it. Although this will probably infuriate retro gamers, it's nowhere near as good as the remake Afterburner Climax. That is an absolute banger of a title. The reasons why Climax is so much better mostly come down to the controls being better so that the gameplay is more enjoyable. This is the exact opposite of what the Master System port of the original game is to the arcade version. The Master System port is not enjoyable because the crosshair is nearly impossible to control and bow rolls are much harder to pull off at an exact time meaning it's harder to dodge enemy missiles. This is not fun, it's an utter pants conversion. Alien Syndrome in the arcade is Sega having a look at the film Aliens and thinking, yep, we'll have some of that. You run around, rescue the prisoners, blast all the aliens in sight. It's a pretty decent game and one that shouldn't be too hard to port, right? I mean, there's nothing here that should tax the mass system too much and considering it can do games like Micro Machines, this should be a walk in the park, right? Wrong! The scrolling shooter is now limited to a single room at a time experience. The shooting is now wank and all the good gameplay is just drained away. Considering the master system is capable of so much more, how did this happen? Sega just shit out this turd into the public and just wasted everybody's time in the process. Almost every single Sega Super Scalar arcade game is great. Endure Racer is not. Although it has the makings of a classic, the stupid mechanic of having to propel yourself miles into the air on each jump to avoid the obstacles on the road means you inevitably launch yourself into trackside danger. The worst thing is, is that the Jeopardy laying in wait on the road has no effect on the other racers, so they can just speed past with no fucks given. Now a game that involves tech that's too much for the master system and gameplay mechanics which are broken before you've even started doesn't sound like it's going to port well to the master system but instead of Sega trying to recreate the same game but on weaker hardware they used their big brains and remade the game and tailored it to the console. I don't need to explain the difference because you can see what's going on here but it's worth saying that this is an enjoyable enough game although more fun if you have the Japanese version over the western and release. For some reason, Sega cut the cartridge to 128 kilobytes down from the Japanese 256 kilobytes. This means five out of the 10 courses have been removed, although this is not something your standard gaming child knew back in the 1980s. Of all the Sega Super Scalar games, OutRun was by far and away the most popular and everyone wanted a way to strap into that cabinet but at home. I had the game on the ZX Spectrum and this is the monstrosity I had to put up with. A barely functioning mess of a conversion where you can actually count the frames per second. It was sick jokes like this that got the British people hyped up for a Sega made home console in the first place. So when OutRun found its way to the Mark III home console in Japan during 1987, it was definitely better than the shitty home ports we had so far and it sort of looks like OutRun but I can't help but feel disappointed now just as much as I did back then. Everything is just too small and it lacks the bold style of the arcade game. It's not a bad game but it just looks and feels like a reskinned hang on conversion.
Do you remember Quartet in the arcade? I do. They had it in the public swim pool when I was a kid. Search the level for the key and make it to the exit. Every so often, you encounter a boss. When this is explained to the player during the intro, the boss does a little dance before running off with the key. The game is called Quartet because it's for up to four players at once, which was uncommon in 1986. Sega also released a stripped down version called Quartet 2, which is the same game, but only allowed up to two people to play. It's this version that Sega ported to the Japanese Mark III in 1987, but they renamed it to Double Target, probably because a two-player game named Quartet is stupid. It's an okay conversion that looks and plays decent enough, that is, until you get to about level 3 and the respawn timers on the mobs drops to about 2 seconds and it becomes unplayable. In the West, they threw the naming logic out of the window and went back to calling it Quartet. Didn't help sales. The best thing to come out of this game though was the music, which Sega rightly keeps adding into each Hatsune Miku game, especially FM Funk, that one's a banger. In 1986, Wonder Boy was released to the arcades and it was a popular title. The combination of an almost never-ending loop 10 second piece of music and every level feeling like a damn ice stage somehow got players hooked. So Sega did a home port right away, but that was to the SG-1000 console and it was shit. So the next year, 1987, Sega tried again, this time releasing it on the Mars system and it was much better. Not just a bit better, but a damn near arcade perfect conversion. Could have done with this sort of effort when you ported Alien Syndrome, but whatever. Now get ready for it, I actually prefer the Master System version over the arcade. I don't even know why, just something more forgiving about its control mechanics which I can't quite put my finger on. A few years later, this got repackaged for the Sega Game Gear and released in America as Revenge of Drancon. Why do you do this, America? I'd complain as much about the cover as the name change, but here in England, we had this as a cover, so maybe I'll shut up now. The ones of you taking notes may have realised I've not covered every arcade port. I've left out games like Bank Panic and SDI, mainly because who the fuck wants to play Bank Panic? It's games like Bubble Bobble I want to play. And when you look at the arcade version, it's got Easy Master System port written all over it. Moving from the arcade version to the Master System version, it's not much of a step down, although it would have been criminal if this conversion was botched, as it should should be a walk in the park for the Master System to handle. It plays just as well as the arcade and looks the part too. To be fair, even the Famicom Disk version is pretty good. You would have to go out of your way to screw this up. I don't know why people still go on about Double Dragon like it's some sort of genre high point. Sure, in 1987 when the arcade version came out, it was pretty good, but it was rendered completely obsolete by Konami just two years later. Double Dragon has jank controls, totally naff game logic, and the game speed comes crashing down to the floor if more than three sprites are on the screen. But if you like this sort of thing, then you might like the Master System version. The Punching and kicking mechanics are totally broken, and the only way to successfully attack an enemy is to jump kick. The Master System only has two buttons on the controller. One is punch and the other one is kick, so I hope you enjoy having to hold both buttons down at the same time. You might be fooled into thinking that this will be like the NES version. No, the Master System version is jank, so in that sense, it's a great arcade conversion. Shinobi in the arcade is a good game. It's not as good as the sequel on the Mega Drive, but it's still pretty good. It's one of those games that's better in my mind than in reality, because when I do play it, I suddenly remember the erratic difficulty spikes. The first couple of levels are pretty smooth sailing, then the boss is bullshit. You can only hit him in this tiny area on his head, and the fireballs he shoots out have no movement pattern and just fly around randomly. The whole Black Turtle area is filled with cheap deaths until you get to the 
the boss, which is a piece of piss. And then level three is a walkover. Plus, don't forget the one hit deaths. Then you get to the Master System version. And although the graphics have taken a hit, the gameplay is miles better. Not only have the difficulty spikes been smoothed out, the cheap deaths have largely been removed. But look here, an energy bar instead of one hit deaths. On top of all this, it absolutely destroys the version of the NES. Take that, Nintendo. The final game on this list has a bit of a strange backstory. This is the sequel to Wonder Boy that you saw earlier. This is Wonder Boy Monster Land. Not only has it changed from a standard platform game to an adventure title, but the English language arcade version you're looking at is actually a bootleg. Sega bought this game to Japanese arcades, but didn't make an official English arcade version. So pirates bootlegged it and translated the game for Western audiences. This is why some of the text seems a bit off. Anyway, in 1988, Sega bought the game to the Sega Mark III home console in Japan. But thanks to the popularity of the pirated arcade version, they knew there was a market in the West for a home version too. So they took what the bootleggers had done and tidied it up a little. That's what you're looking at now, and it's a damn fine conversion to the Mars system. In fact, I'd go as far as saying it's one of the best games on the system. I'll end the video here because even though there were a lot more arcade conversions of the Mars system, at this point Sega themselves were more focused on the newly released Mega Drive, where they initially pushed to bring the arcade experience home.